What I was talking about was the first exhibit that I was involved in here, which was, was with Shane Point and his family on the memorial ceremony that they did for their sister, uh, Margaret Point Lewis. And it was called To Wash Away the Tears and references that um, a memorial among the Musqueam is held frequently four years or more after the person has passed away at the time when the family is ready to wash away the tears, to stop crying at the memory of the loved one uh, that they have lost. For me, it was a really instructive exhibit. Um, when we brought the canoe back to the building and we were writing the labels and constructing the exhibit, I was working with a group of students, and so I asked them to go and write the labels, and they went and wrote the labels, and they came back. And I read the labels and I said, okay, now go and write the labels using only quotes from the people we've spoken to. And they brought the labels back. And I said, which labels do you prefer and why? And they looked at the labels and they said, oh, we like the labels that have the community voice on them. They just sound uh, like someone is talking to you. They're so much more personable than the labels that we had written. And so this is another theme that, that leads into some of my museum work, this idea that we talked about briefly before about uh, voice in um, an exhibit. And when we come to talk about Cessnam, the city before the city exhibit, we'll, we'll come back to that issue of voice. Uh, but at the, so when we were doing uh, To Wash Away the Tears, when we were finishing up the exhibit or putting deciding how to install the exhibit. Shane came in and we talked to him about the labels and we talked to him about how to install the exhibit. And he said to us, you know, you're really the professionals in that area. So while I can tell you what I think the connections are, you put the things out the way that you think they should go because that's, you understand how the visitors are going to respond to things more than I do. So I respect your expertise in the way that you respected my expertise. So at the end of the project, uh, I talked to Shane about it, the whole experience, and I said, so how did you feel about the collaboration? And he said, this isn't the collaboration. And I said, what do you mean? Right? Because collaboration is sort of one of the things that runs through my work. And he said, for me, I don't like the term collaboration. And I said, Shane, you know, why don't, why don't you like the term collaboration? He said, well, I grew up watching World War II movies. You never wanted to be the collaborator. Why, w why would I want to be a collaborator? And he said, besides that, the term collaboration uh, suggests an end. Collaboration is people coming together to do a particular project and then it's finished. And he said, but what we've been building is a relationship. And so I think what we've really been having is a conversation. And this is a conversation that isn't over yet. And I thought, ah. So that's a great learning point uh, for all of us, for the students and for myself that were involved uh, in that project, is that so many times when you're working on something, you wrap it up, you finish it up, you've written the book, you've done the exhibit, whatever it is, you finish the film, <laughs> you've closed the chapter, <laughs> and it's done. But working with community doing community engaged research is never like that. Those relationships continue on and on. So that conversation doesn't end. It has that possibility. It may, it may lapse for a while, but there's always the chance to pick up the threads and have it uh, continue. And I've had that happen, particularly with Shane on a number of occasions when I didn't, when things, when I didn't expect them. So to give you an example of, of, of that, uh, I was sitting in my office and I was talking to somebody about a piece of work and they, somebody came in and said, so we need to do this, this piece of, this, we need to do some work with the ancestors and it requires some tobacco. Do you have any tobacco? We, we need this for later today. 
I'm like, I don't have any tobacco on me. I'm sorry, no. And I walk out into the museum and there's Shane and he walks up to me and he says, somebody gave me this tobacco earlier today and I think you should have it. There was no way that he knew that I needed that tobacco right then and there. I'm like, thank you so much, I need this right now. <laughs> So it's those kinds of things that you never quite know when things are going to, to pop up. And we have that kind of relationship where all of a sudden he'll appear and I haven't seen him for ages and it will be just the right time for something that either he needs or I need. And so that conversation uh, continues and references back to the work that we did uh, with, for his, on his late sister's memorial service. So I think what I'd like to do now is actually do something that I should have probably done at the start. So when people um, arrive um, here at the Museum of Anthropology and we're doing tours with them, or we have openings, um, and more and more so at any formal event that you go to uh, here on the campus at, at the University of British Columbia, we start the event by saying, welcome to the ancestral unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. And today is September 26, 2016. And it's actually the same time as the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall are visiting British Columbia. And they will have received a similar welcome when they arrived yesterday on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples uh, in Victoria. When I arrived here in 2001, this museum was, sit, was doing Musqueam welcomes at openings for all their exhibits, but you almost never heard anything on campus. Now, wherever we go, this phrase has become something that is spoken and said all the time, and it shows a, a fundamental shift in the university and in the way that things happen, but frequently it's not unpacked. And I think it's really important to unpack it for the people that hear that phrase, because most people that hear that phrase, there are words in it that they don't understand, or they don't, and some of them are words that they may never have heard before. So we start with the ancestral, and one of the questions that, uh, if you're working here on the coast, that people will frequently ask you is, who are you? And what you're being asked is not, I'm Sue and I'm from the Museum of Anthropology, but you're being asked, where are you from? Who are your ancestors? What are your teachings? How do they make them who you are? And so that sense of ancestral, the fact that this is the space, the land, the area around us, that for Musqueam, people have been living on for thousands of years is a critically important one for people to understand. Uh, we had an exhibit here called Sesnam, the city before the city, and there was a huge banner out front of the museum. And the quote on the banner was from um, Howard Grant Kayapalano, and it said, the newcomers have been here for 200 years. That's just a blink of an eye compared to the 9,000 years we've been here. That's the, that ancestral, right? And then the idea of territory. So many times when people are studying uh, recent history and they're thinking about territory, they think about the reserve and they don't understand that the territory is a huge space. That when you look around Vancouver, you see the paved areas. This is all territory that was where people lived and thrived and fished and hunted, had their families, right? As, as, uh, as um, Morgan Guerin from Muscombe says, lived and loved, right? Uh, and have been doing so, and it's not just the reserve. It's this huge space around us. It's all the lands and the waterways that we can see. 
So that's really a, another aspect of that. Uh, Hunkaminam is the indigenous language of Musqueam. And again, in BC, uh, there is a huge language diversity, but the languages here are so threatened. And the revitalization work, the phenomenal work that it, communities are, and efforts that communities are putting in to ensuring that their languages continue is sometimes things that people from other parts of the world or even other parts of Canada haven't, haven't thought about the strength of community to preserve, develop, teach, and revitalize their languages. When some communities have, were at stages where they went down to only one or two speakers. Uh, Musqueam is the community's name for themselves. The word that most people have never heard before is unseated. And that is a fundamental game changer to understand the term unseated and what it means. Because unseated means that there was never a treaty here. There is no basis of a relationship between the indigenous communities in this region, and that's almost all of British Columbia, and the people that live here today, the settlers like myself, right? We were welcomed as guests, as Howard Grant would say, but the expectation was we would behave like guests. And we didn't. We behaved like we owned it. Uh, and so that sense of unseated and the need to create, to even start somewhere, to have somewhere where we can have a dialogue about the relationship, about the lands that have been uh, irrevocably altered and changed and stripped away from the communities is something that we all, is a challenge to everybody to think about. So we say that phrase over and over again, but to me and my work here, it's really important that the students that I work with understand that, that that's their starting point for realizing where we are today and how we need to, to behave and engage. So that's, I just wanted to make sure that we, we covered that somewhere uh, in, in what we're talking about today. So Musqueam has um, worked really hard to help this museum become the museum it is today. Many other Indigenous community members and many other Indigenous communities have also worked, but we are on Musqueam's unceded territory. And so museums are an uncomfortable space for indigenous communities, spaces where their heritage has been captured, Michael Ames Road, uh, Cannibal Tours and Glass Boxes, um, where heritage has been captured, Cole Harris Road, uh, Doug Cole Harris, Cole Douglas Cole, Douglas Cole, yes? Cole. Captured heritage, right? So talking about how the material culture was stripped away from communities and taken to museums and put on display, divorced from its intangible, as, as though tangible and intangible heritages can be sort of split into two silos in the way that we silo academic uh, disciplines. So uh, museums are very difficult spaces for indigenous communities because of that history of where museums came from, museums being part of, museums in North America, being part of the colonial enterprise, museums and anthropologists being the people that actually promoted the concept of the vanishing Indian, right? And then took the heritage and put it on display to say, see, here's the vanishing Indian, right? That's part of us. That's part of what we as a discipline were engaged in 
and did, and we need to accept that that's our heritage, and we need to build on that, not just sweep it under the carpet, because we can do that as well. But over time, various things have happened, one of which is that indigenous communities have felt sometimes more comfortable in bringing museums to task. And that's sometimes because of relationships that existed. So this museum in particular, was this museum was set up by um, Harry and Audrey Hawthorne. And another person who was foundational to this museum was Charles Borden, an archeologist, who's sometimes called the grandfather or father of BC archeology. span They all worked here in, at UBC. And they also had strong relationships with people from Musqueam. And so, but those were very personal relationships rather than a, an institutional Musqueam community to the museum or Musqueam to the university relationships. And it's not until quite a bit later, uh, for example, in uh, 19, I think it's, I think it's the mid 70s, the museum was erecting uh, a totem pole on the grounds here. And uh, the late Delbert Guerin, who was chief of Musqueam at the time, was out fishing. And he got home from fishing and there were some phone calls from him. And uh, he tells the story that he was, so he was out, he picks up, he calls back, it's a CBC reporter. He calls back the CBC reporter and the CBC reporter says, how do you feel about the totem pole that they put up at the Museum of Anthropology today. And he says, so those are the drums that I heard when I was out fishing today. How would you feel if somebody came and put a cross on your lawn and didn't ask your permission? Right? So feeling, you know, being having that strength to say, to call the museum to question, to say, what are you guys doing? You're on our territory and you don't even have the courtesy when you put up a totem pole from a different culture on your grounds, which is our land, to come and ask our permission to do that, right? And along the way, Musqueam has continued that education. I'm one in a long line of people that they have uh, the, of the museum, because it's the education of the museum, and as a member of the museum, it's my, I'm part of the museum, so part of the education. There's been a number of these kinds of very important um, events that have happened. So another one that I can turn to is the exhibit in uh, 1980-81 that was done by uh, Michael Q, another phenomenal anthropologist, uh, called Visions of Power, Symbols of Wealth. First exhibit anywhere to treat solely the material heritage of Salish peoples. Because anthropologists looked at Salish peoples and they said, oh, look at the artwork up north, it's better. I mean, that's a very simplified way of saying it. And, but basically, the, the, the material heritage of this, of this region was sort of put in the cupboards and the material culture heritage of the north with the totem poles, totem poles aren't made here, with the totem poles was fetid and, and um, distributed and installed everywhere. So Michael Q did this first exhibit. He put out on display a piece of ceremony, uh, he put out on display ceremonial regalia. Okay. Specifically, um, an outfit that uh, is worn for a period of time by an individual going through a particular ceremony and would then be taken and put away. And 
He arranged for it to be cleansed. The family agreed that it should be put on display. Right? In fact, 1981, right? So huge amount of consultation, collaboration, uh, involvement of the community in this uh, regalia being put on display. Put it on display. And shortly thereafter, uh, Leona Sparrow, who's from Musqueam, uh, and has, uh, I think at the time, I'm not certain where she was in her career at the time, but she, she has a master's in anthropology and she has a law degree, so I don't know where she was in her studies at the time in 81. I think she just finished her master's. She was working for Musqueam, and she was called onto the floor of the house during a ceremony. She's called um, and asked to come up to the museum and to tell the museum that they needed to come down and explain what they were doing and why. And so that resulted in Michael Q and Michael Ames going down to Musqueam, talking to the community, specifically to the people that are involved in this ceremony that was the regalia came from and in having the regalia removed from the exhibit. And a sign put up saying, this regalia has been removed because of the community feeling that this is improper. So those kinds of events, they're so small in many ways, but they're so important because there's an instance where the community can see that they brought something forward to the museum, this huge concrete block-like thing. Gorgeous building, absolutely beautiful building, but it is concrete and glass. They brought something forward to, this, to the museum, and the museum listened and changed their practice. And that's what Musqueam has been doing with this museum, ongoing, all that time, is the ongoing education of people uh, and, and, uh, and of the university as well to, to, to help us to understand who we are and what our role is when we're here in this space. So that's just two examples that I've given you of those kinds of things happening, but there's lots of other kinds of things and one of the things that sometimes gets lost in the literature when we're writing about those things and we write about collaborative practice because uh, we're the academics writing about the collaborative practice is we sometimes write about it as a bit as about we were self-reflexive, we were self-critical, we changed and we sometimes forget the enormous effort that communities have put into educating us and to trying to get us to see a different way and to be self-reflexive and critical about what we're doing. So that's, uh, I think, a very important part about museums and the way that museums are shifting and the importance of anthropology and museums and the dialogue that's happening today in the museum world about how communities represent themselves in a, choose to represent themselves in a space like this.